the Islamic militant group ISIS, formerly known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and recently rebranded as the so-called Islamic State, is the stuff of nightmares. They are ruthless, fanatical killers on a mission. And that mission is to wipe out anyone and everyone from any other religion or belief system and to impose Sharia law. The mass executions, beheadings, and even crucifixions that they are committing as they work towards this goal are flaunted like badges of pride videotaped and uploaded for the whole world to see. This is the new face of evil. Would it interest you to know who helped these psychopaths rise to power? Would it interest you to know who armed them, funded them, and trained them? Would it interest you to know why? This story makes a lot more sense if we start in the middle. So we'll begin with the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. The Libyan revolution was Barack Obama's first major foreign intervention. He was portrayed as an extension of the Arab Spring, and NATO involvement was framed in humanitarian terms. The fact that the CIA was actively working to help the Libyan rebels topple Gaddafi was no secret, nor were the airstrikes that Obama ordered against the Libyan government. However, little was said about the identity or the ideological leanings of the Libyan rebels. Not really surprising considering the fact that the leader of the Libyan rebels later admitted that his fighters included Al-Qaeda-linked jihadists who had fought against Allied troops in Iraq. These jihadist militants from Iraq were part of what national security analysts commonly referred to as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And remember, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was ISIS before it was rebranded. With the assistance of US and NATO intelligence and air support, the Libyan rebels captured Gaddafi and summarily executed him in the street, all the while enthusiastically chanting, Allah Akbar. For many who had bought the official line about how these rebels were freedom fighters aiming to establish a liberal democracy in Libya, this was the beginning of the end of their illusions. Prior to the US and NATO-backed intervention, Libya had the highest standard of living of any country in Africa. This according to the UN's Human Development Index ratings for 2010. However, in the years following the coup, the country descended into chaos, with extremism and violence running rampant. Libya is now widely regarded as a failed state. Now, after Gaddafi was overthrown, the Libyan armories were looted and massive quantities of weapons were sent by the Libyan rebels to Syria. The weapons, which included anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles, were smuggled into Syria through Turkey, a NATO ally. The Times of London reported on the arrival of the shipment on September 14, 2012. This was just three days after Ambassador Chris Stevens was killed in the attack in the U.S. Embassy in Benghazi. Chris Stevens had served as the U.S. government's liaison to the Libyan rebels since April of 2011. While a great deal of media attention is focused on the fact that the State Department did not provide adequate security at the consulate and was slow to send assistance when the attack started, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Seymour Hersh released an article in April of 2014 which exposed a classified agreement between the CIA, Turkey, and the Syrian rebels to create what was referred to as a rat line. The rat line was a covert network used to channel weapons and ammunition from Libya through southern Turkey and across the Libyan border. Funding was provided by Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. With Stevens dead, any direct U.S. involvement in that arms shipment was buried, and Washington would continue to claim that they had not sent heavy weaponry into Syria. It was at this time that jihadist fighters from Libya began flooding into Syria as well, and not just low-level militants. Many were experienced commanders who had fought in multiple theaters. The U.S. and its allies were now fully focused on taking down Assad's government in Syria. As in Libya, this regime change was to be framed in terms of human rights. And now overt support began to supplement the backdoor channels. The growing jihadist presence was swept under the rug and covered up. However, as the rebels gained strength, the reports of war crimes and atrocities that they were committing began to create a bit of a public relations problem for Washington. It then became standard policy to insist that U.S. support was only being given to what they referred to as moderate rebels. This distinction, however, had no basis in reality. In an interview given in April of 2014, FSA Commander Jamal Marouf admitted that his fighters regularly conduct joint operations with al-Nusra. Al-Nusra is the official al-Qaeda branch in Syria. This statement is further validated in an interview given in June of 2013 by Colonel Abdel Basset al-Tawil, commander of the FSA's Northern Front. In this interview, he openly discusses his ties with al-Nusra and expresses his desire to see Syria ruled by Sharia law. أما فيما يخص بعض الفصائل التي مثلا يطالب الغرب بتصنيفها كمنظمة إرهابية جبهة النصرة نعم نحن نشعر أن هذه الجبهة بمكان ما هي يمكن الحوار معها حول حول نعم حول طبيعة الدولة القادمة حول 
شكل الدولة القادمة حول أمكانية هذه البلد على إقامة دولة التي تناسب الجميع نحن في مكان ما يجب أن نتعاون ويجب أن نتحاور وأنا على صلة بالجميع أنا على صلة بالجميع ولا أخفي سرا بذلك حتى فيما يخص يعني الأخوة في جبهة نصرة ونتعاون في أمكنة كثيرة ماذا تؤيدون أنتم؟ ما هو شكل الدولة الذي تؤيدون؟ أنا بصراحة العبارة أنا أرغب في دولة دولة يعني يكون طباعها حضاري لكن أن يكون شرعها إسلامي Moderate rebels? Well, it's complicated. Not that this should really come as any surprise. Reuters have reported in 2012 that the FSA's command was dominated by Islamic extremists. And the New York Times had reported that same year that the majority of the weapons that Washington was sending to Syria were ending up in the hands of jihadists. For two years, the U.S. government knew that this was happening, but they kept doing it. And the FSA's ties to al-Nusra are just the beginning. In June of 2014, al-Nusra merged with ISIS at the border between Iraq and Syria. So, to review, the FSA is working with al-Nusra, Al-Nusra is working with ISIS, and the U.S. has been sending money and weapons to the FSA, even though they've known since 2012 that most of these weapons are ending up in the hands of extremists. Do the math. In that context, the sarin gas attacks of 2013, which turned out to have been committed by the Syrian rebels, makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? If it wasn't enough that U.N. investigators, Russian investigators, and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Seymour Hersh all pinned that crime on Washington's proxies, the rebels themselves threatened the West that they would expose what really happened if they were not given more advanced weaponry within one month. سيتابع في تخازله تجاه ثورتنا سنفصح عما لدينا من إثباتات وأنا أقول ذلك وأعتقد أنك تعرف جيدا أننا صادقون فيما أقول 